This is a real picture of our planet rotating in space. Neither artist's impression nor computer graphic, but time-lapse from a space probe. It's this spin of the Earth, never before recorded from space, that causes the sun to trek daily across the sky. A 24-hour cycle that makes day and night, sunrise and sunset, What many don't realize is that this same spin moves the stars through the sky. A combination of the rotation of Earth and its annual orbit of the Sun means that our perspective of the cosmos through the Sun changes by four minutes every day. This line is a partial view of the Sun's seasonal movement against the background stars, the ecliptic. Astrologers of old placed figures along the line, forms suggested by groups of stars, groups we know today as constellations. The constellations of the ecliptic form the zodiac, a pattern found even in the temples of ancient Egypt. Astrology and astronomy have long diverged, but the mythical names of the constellations persist. To find their way about the heavens, modern astronomers divide the sky into a grid. Longitudinal lines are called right ascension, calibrations of hours, minutes and seconds. Latitude or declination marks degrees north or south of the celestial equator. The index finger and little finger are the simplest measuring device. At arm's length from the eye, they measure off roughly 15 degrees against the sky. That's equivalent to 30 moon breadths, for the moon, not to scale here, fills about half a degree. The clenched fist equals some 10 degrees. Three fingers, five degrees. One finger, approximately one degree, or two moon breadths. This deliberately defocused photograph reveals the true colours of stars. We see them like this because our eyes are insensitive to the subtleties of starlight. The stars should look like this, an astronomical photograph or the view through binoculars. Good binoculars are the first essential for a new observer. Marked on every pair are numbers specifying magnification and lens size these 10 times 50. The 10 indicates that this pair will give a tenfold magnification of the image. The 50 is the size of the lenses, both 50 millimeters. Here the eyepieces are marked 5 millimeters. That's the width of the exit pupil, the light beam from the eyepieces. The size you need depends on age. If you're under 40, the pupils of your eyes will dilate to 7 millimeters. If you're over 40, just five. So, if you're young, you'll see the best images through an exit pupil of seven millimeters. Therefore, look for binoculars marked seven times 50, or 10 times 70. By dividing the figures, you get the exit pupil. What we see in binoculars depends on where we are on Earth. The axis of Earth has the North Pole pointing close to the pole star Polaris. Thus Polaris is the only virtually fixed star in the sky. From wherever you stand on Earth, only half the sky is visible. That's why Polaris appears lower and lower in the sky the further south you go. By the time you reach the equator, Polaris will be sitting on the horizon from, say, Nairobi. In the southern hemisphere, Polaris disappears altogether. But starting from Singapore, the south pole of the sky gets higher and higher 
the further south you travel. Here, with the Anglo-Australian telescope in silhouette, the stars of the southern polar region, as Earth rotates. This is a chart of the region. The Milky Way stretches across the sky, an edge-on view of our galaxy. Top center is Crux, the stars of the Southern Cross, a signpost. Extend a line through two of them, and there's the Southern Pole, an empty space. Within the circle are the circumpolar stars, visible any clear night. Among them, the large Magellanic Cloud and its companion, the small Magellanic Cloud, satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Top left to Alpha Centauri. This is the brightest member of the constellation, the group of stars known as Centaurus. To the right, and Canopus, the second brightest star in the sky. It belongs to the constellation of Carina, Downwards now to Hydrus, the constellation of the little snake, and below to Achenar, the most brilliant star in the long and winding constellation of the river Eridanus. To the left, Parvo, the peacock. Just above, Ara, the altar. A little to the right, Triangulum Australi, the southern triangle, and nearest the southern pole, Octans. And there they are, the trails of the polar stars in an overnight exposure. To the northern pole now, in the second leg of this introduction to the heavens. The Milky Way is strung across the northern sky. The pole star Polaris is at the very centre, shining bright in the constellation of the little bear, Ursa Minor. Next door, Draco, the constellation of the dragon. Just below, Ursa Major, the great bear. Top centre, Cassiopeia, the queen. To the left, Hercules, another Greek hero. Next to his queen, Cepheus. And top right, the constellation of Perseus. Some bright stars. Vega in the constellation of Lyra. Higher up, Deneb in Cygnus the Swan. And to the right, Capella in Origa. And now those northern stars in another long exposure. The best guide to the northern polar sky is the constellation of Ursa Major. From these two stars is the direction of the pole star, Polaris. Polaris, in Ursa Minor. A line through Polaris from Mizar in Ursa Major leads to Cassiopeia. These two in Ursa Major point to the star Capella, a brilliant point in the constellation of Auriga. This pair in Ursa Major point to another important star, Regulus. Regulus in the constellation of Leo. Finally, extend the tail of Ursa Major and it leads to Arcturus, a red giant star in the constellation of Boertes the Herdsman. Go on a little and there's brilliant Spica. An introduction to the workings of the sky.